from labeling the periodic table, we know that our metals are located to the left of the staircase. What are the properties of metals? So I grab some examples of metals from my house. I have a piece of aluminum foil and I also found some steel wool. So steel wool is used for um, kind of like sanding, especially if you want to sand something that's metal, um, get some rust off of something, you might use steel wool. And granted it's called steel wool, but it's an example of the element of iron. What do these both have in common? Well, first off, they're bendable. And the word for bendable, when we talk about metals being bendable, is malleable. So I'm going to write that down. In addition, you may have noticed that both metals, but in particular the aluminum foil was very shiny. And if you have gold jewelry or silver jewelry, you're like, oh yeah, metals tend to be shiny. That's called luster. Another thing that metals do is they conduct heat and electricity. This is why our pots and pans are made out of metal because they're good at conducting heat and wires for instance are made out of copper because again um, we're going to take advantage of the fact they conduct electricity the last property last vocabulary word that i wanted to write down is ductile when something's ductile it can be drawn into thin wires so it may be hard, a little bit difficult to see, but as I'm pulling on the steel wool, there's like hair-like fibers that it consists of. And this is possible because of the ductile nature of metals. That's also, for instance, why um, they're used for wires. Not only do they conduct electricity, we can actually form them into wires. Most metals are solids at room temperature. The big exception is mercury. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And you can choose any examples that you want from the left of the staircase. I'm gonna uh, write down the ones we just discussed. So aluminum. We have the steel wool, which is iron. Fe is the elemental symbol for iron. Copper. We got silver. Then we have other ones that we don't necessarily think of metals, but they are metals. So sodium or calcium. Those are all metals. The non-metals are located to the right of the staircase. And the only example that I could think of that I had at home of a non-metal was pencil lead. Now I know we call it lead, but pencil lead is actually graphite or carbon. So this is elemental carbon. And what about its properties? So first off, and you can look at your own pencils, right? Not very shiny. So no luster. The other thing is that it breaks really easily, right? And so it's not malleable like the aluminum foil or the steel wool. So it's brittle and it can be described as dull. Additionally, it's a non-conductor, so much so that Nonmetals are sometimes used as insulators. Carbon's a great insulator and also a great um, lubricant. If you grind up the graphite in your pencil, um, you'll notice it becomes very slippery. And everything's the opposite here. You can't um, somehow form 
the nonmetals into wires. Their states at room temperature are all over the place. So we have solids like the carbon, it's in your pencil, or sulfur, which is like a yellow um, element that smells kind of rotten, like rotten eggs. There's liquids. Bromine, which comes as a diatomic element is naturally a liquid at room temperature. And finally, there's gases. So oxygen gas, nitrogen gas. Our last um, category here are the metalloids or semi-metals. They're located along the staircase. And they have properties of both. So the one that I wish I had a piece of, I'll show a picture of it um, in the video, but it's silicon. It's very brittle. It reminds me of some kind of like sedimentary rock or something in that pieces of it will just flake off. But at the same time, it's uh, very shiny and has luster. So depending on which semi-metal you're talking about, you can get some combination of the properties of metals and non-metals. It just depends on the element. They're all gonna be solids at room temperature. And honestly, the five that you need to know offhand, silicon, um, geranium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium, so those elements along the staircase. Hydrogen, with an atomic number of one, is all the way on the left-hand side of the periodic table. However, it is a non-metal, even though it's all the way on the left. So maybe even if we flip to page four, we can say our non-metals are to the right of the staircase. And we do have an exception there. And that's gonna be hydrogen gas. On question two, we're asked to arrange the elements in pairs based off of which elements we expect to see similar chemical properties. So, I'm gonna do this based off of the group number. So for instance, since potassium and sodium are both in group one, and they're both alkali metals, I expect them to both be super reactive and flammable if I throw them into some water. Fluorine and chlorine are both in group seven, they're both halogens. They're both diatomic because everything in group seven exists naturally as a diatomic element. And they're also very reactive. Then we have phosphorus and nitrogen, which are group five elements and Group five, they tend to like to form covalent molecules a lot of the time. So you'll see these as we get more into the course, um, serving as the central atoms in covalent molecules. In problem three, we're asked to draw Lewis dot diagrams for the listed elements. Lewis dot diagrams show the number of valence electrons associated with a particular element. And this is based off of its group number, right? So if there's an element in the middle, you'll write its elemental symbol. And then we're gonna represent the valence electrons by little dots. And the dots, if you had to use all eight electrons, like if you had a group 8A, you'd arrange the dots like this. And then it doesn't really matter where you put them if you have less to arrange. So the first example 
is calcium. Calcium is in group two, so we know it has two electrons. So maybe something like that. We have nitrogen. Nitrogen is in group five, so I need to put five dots around nitrogen. Selenium is in group six, so I'll do six dots around selenium. Cesium is in group one. And then we have xenon, which is a noble gas. So that's going to have to have all eight dots. But again, with the cesium, the position of the dot doesn't matter. You could do it like that, too, if you want it. In question four on page five, we're asked to complete another table, very similar to the previous table that we did together. You're definitely going to need a copy of your periodic table to complete this. So in the first row, we're given the element name of aluminum. And I look it up on the periodic table. That has an atomic number of 13. And I rounded the mass. You can feel free to round it to the hundredths place um, for convenience. So I put it in as 26.98. And I guess I should put units. So I'm going to put units at the top here. That's going to be in atomic mass units, all of the values that you write down. The group number, it's going to be group 3, 3A. And the period is also 3 because it's in the third row of the periodic table. And even though it's along the staircase, aluminum is classified as a metal. As you saw earlier, right, with our piece of metal, its properties um, match that of a metal, and it doesn't really have any non-metal properties that would justify classifying it as a metalloid. The next row here, we have Br, which stands for bromine. It has an atomic number of 35. Its mass is 79.90 AMU. It's in group 7A of the periodic table. And it's in the fourth row, so we'll say it's in the fourth period. And bromine is definitely a nonmetal. It is a diatomic nonmetal. On the next one, we have barium. I know it's barium because if I look at my periodic table, number 56 is barium. It has a mass of 137.33 AMU. Its symbol is BA. It's in group 2A. And it's in row 6 of the periodic table, so period 6. And it's a metal. Everything on the left side is a metal. Last one, we have to identify by the group and the period. So I'm um, all the way on the right in group 7A, and I'm in period 4. So remember to count up here, even though we're in group 7A right here. We don't want to start this counting here, right? This is row one, this is row two, row three, row four. So group 7A row four is going to be bromine again. And yes, it's a duplicate of the previous bromine. So I'm just 35 and then the mass is the same. Moving on to the next exercise. How many protons are in the nucleus of an atom with an atomic number of 15? So I could use my periodic table, but I really don't need to. Um, number 15 is phosphorus, but the number, the atomic number gives me the number of protons. So since they gave me the atomic number, I know that we're talking about something with 15 protons. If a neutral atom 
has an atomic number of 20, how many electrons does it have? The atomic number for neutral atoms is equal to both the number of protons and the number of electrons. Here we're asked to calculate a mass number. This is a cool problem. So protons contribute to mass and neutrons contribute to mass. We're not going to count the electrons because they're very lightweight and they're in the electron cloud. So we're going to go with 7 as the mass number, 3 plus 4. How many neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom with an atomic number of atomic mass of 36 and an atomic number of 25? So we need to take the difference between these numbers to calculate the number of neutrons. So here we're going to go with 11. On letter E, we're asked to provide the atomic symbol of an element with the atomic number of 36. So it looks like we're over here, Krypton. So the atomic symbol is just Kr. And in the last problem, how many protons does silver have? And we need to find silver on the periodic table. Its symbol is Ag, and it's number 47. So that tells me that it has 47 protons.